Welcome to the Pretty Good Policy for Crypto podcast, where we have in-depth discussions on cryptocurrency policy and regulation. My name is Paul Brigner, head of U.S. policy and strategic advocacy for the Electric Coin Company. In a few moments, you will hear from Gary Weinstein, head of global regulatory relations at Electric Coin Company, and our guest, Luke Hogue, director of outreach at Lincoln Network. We believe in fostering a respectful and inclusive environment for our discussions. And while we at Electric Coin Company hold strong opinions about the need for private and confidential financial transactions in crypto to promote economic freedom, our guests may have differing views. Through these thought-provoking and at times challenging conversations, we aim to deepen our understanding of complex policy and regulatory issues and work towards the development of pretty good policy for the cryptocurrency world. This podcast is for educational purposes only and is not legal or financial advice. Our guest remarks may not reflect those of their organization or of Electric Coin Company. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the podcast. I'd like to welcome Luke Hogue to the PGP for Crypto podcast. Luke serves as Director of Outreach at Lincoln Network, an organization seeking to bridge the gap between innovators and policymakers for a freer and more abundant future. In other words, a focus on the intersection of technological innovation and public policy. Lincoln Policy, under the umbrella organization Lincoln Network, is a boutique think tank that works with policymakers and tech innovators to promote market-oriented ideas to strengthen American innovation. Prior to joining Lincoln Network, Luke was Federal Affairs Manager at FreedomWorks, where he primarily focused on blockchain, internet governance, and regulatory issues. He holds a BA in Government and Data Science from the College of William and Mary. Welcome, Luke. It's great to have you here. Well, thanks, Gary. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Luke, you recently co-authored, together with Antonio Garcia Martinez, a policy report for Lincoln Network that I would like to explore a bit. The intriguing title is To Be a Stranger Among Strangers, Ad Tech, Web3, and Data Privacy. But before we do, could you please let us know a bit more about Lincoln Network and your role there? Well, sure. So Lincoln Network uh, has been around for a long time and has kind of had several different iterations. Um, so originally, we were founded out of Silicon Valley. Um, and the original goal was to help bridge the gap between DC and, and the tech world and then was completely centered around Silicon Valley in San Francisco, um, but it has since kind of spread out throughout the country. Um, really what our founders, uh, Garrett and Aaron, found was they had spent time in uh, civil society, they had spent time in the tech world, and they found that those two worlds really spoke very different languages. And when uh, government came in and tried to regulate or legislate on on tech and tech issues, um, it created problems. You know, I, I often like to say that it's it's nearly impossible to properly regulate that which you don't understand. Um, and when it came to tech and especially emerging tech, um, that was really a problem that they saw. And so um, we were originally founded to just kind of foster conversations between um, those two worlds of Silicon Valley and DC. Um, and since then, we've kind of blossomed into this bigger organization with a broader mission. Um, and so I work on the the policy side of this, as you mentioned, um, which is really, a, we, we like to say, a boutique think tank. So uh, your traditional think tank, you know, has a bunch of scholars that, that focus on various different issues from healthcare to taxes to tech. Um, but we po focus almost entirely on, on tech and innovation issues. Um, and that's, you know, a broad umbrella. Um, but my role there as director of outreach is I, I wear a lot of different hats. So, you know, I do a lot of our interaction with uh, Capitol Hill. I do a lot of our interaction with uh, kind of outside organizations. But I also do my own research and advocacy. Um, and that's primarily centered around decentralized technologies, decentralizing technologies, um, and how we should be thinking about these, these technologies in the broader conversations uh, of tech policy. That's very helpful. Thank you. You know, in your article, you talk a little bit about the transition from Web 2 to Web 3. And before I dive into some questions about your policy report, it might be helpful to have sort of a level set understanding about what you mean by Web 3. Certainly, our audience has an appreciation for that. Um, but to have your uh, perspective on Web 3 and the translation, to borrow your word, 
uh, from Web 2 to Web 3 would be um, would be helpful as a foundation for our discussion. Well, sure. And I think it's a really, really important and uh, deceivingly difficult question to answer. Um, because there's various different ways that we can think about what Web3 uh, is, could be, might be. Um, and, you know, people use a lot of different terms. It's Web3, it's the D-Web, the decentralized web. Um, and all of those kind of have various tinges uh, of differences of meaning. So um, when I'm talking about Web3, uh, what I generally am referring to is um, the decentralized web, right? This idea of a return to um, web one. And so um, I think the in order to understand what what I mean when I refer to web one, you kind of have to take a step back and think about the history of the architecture of the internet as we know it. So right, um, obviously there's kind of the start with um, with DARPAnet and uh, these you know original packet switching networks that are going from from colleges and universities. Um, and that's kind of web zero, right? That's this very closed off system that the DOD started running. Um, and then eventually that kind of develops into um, a protocol driven network uh, of the World Wide Web, you know, the Tim Berners-Lee version of the internet, um, where you start to get some new platforms and some new ways of, of going about things. Um, but generally when, you know, we think about web one, it's, it's pretty open, right? Um, it's pretty decentralized. People are running um, big mainframe computers. Uh, and over time, more platforms are developed and it kind of has this transition into um, Web 2. And so to me, Web 2 is the iteration of the internet that we are experiencing right now. This is a very centralized and controlled environment that is primarily controlled by um, a select few firms and companies. Um, so whether you think about kind of the infrastructure of the internet and, and cloud hosting, um, that's all really concentrated among, you know, AWS and Microsoft Azure, um, the platforms, the, the, the ways that we interact with the internet are pretty much centralized among a select few players of, you know, you have Meta and Google, um, and Amazon, uh, and they all kind of have, uh, we like to call them walled gardens. So they've built, um, their little area of the internet. Um, and so really, uh, what we're talking about now in the broader conversation of tech policy, you know, the the distrust people have towards big tech platforms, the the issues around whether it be content moderation or antitrust or, you know, any of these conversations that pop up in Washington, D.C. and in the states around these big tech platforms um, are really, in my view, uh, a problem of decentral or of centralization uh, of control and who gets to control and kind of the, you know, um, the famous phrase, who watches the watchman, right? So these companies have a lot of control over our digital environment. Um, and so in that sense, Web3 is sort of a, an inversion of that. So, you know, using things like blockchain, using decentralized technologies, decentralized platforms, decentralized transactions, um, it really is an attempt to get back to the original vision of what the internet was supposed to be as a, as a really open and iterative place, this kind of vision that Tim Berners-Lee obviously, um, you know, espouses and, and still continues to espouse to this day. Um, and so, you know, this can have a, a lot of various aspects to it. And there's kind of a lot of different nuances that we can get into of, of you know, what does it look like? Um, but part of the problem of defining what Web3 is, is that it's, it's a vision of the future. It's um, an idea of what the internet could be um, if we implement uh, these decentralizing technologies in the ways that we want to. Um, so I hope that helps. It's not a great answer, and I think we can get into uh, some of the, the nuances there. That is a great answer, actually. Um, but I will push back a little bit and say there are some in the blockchain ecosystem that are saying it's time to retire the terminology Web3. What are your thoughts about that? You know, I think um, having been and dealt with kind of tech issues a lot and especially emerging tech issues, um, I think you, it's funny, you're seeing the same kind of conversation in, in debates around AI, you know, with the advent of ChatGPT and GPT-3 you know, the suite more generally. Um, this is kind of, it's always a constant issue of, of branding and marketing, right? Um, 
So to me, whether we use the term Web3 or the term D-Web or, you know, somebody else comes up with a, a brand new term that, that everyone goes on board with, um, I'm, I'm totally all, all for, um, you know, figuring out what the best branding is. I get the idea that the, the term Web3 is kind of uh, wonky and weird and requires a lot of explanation um, and has a lot of, you know, different interpretations. People um, have their kind of project their own vision of the future onto the term as well. Um, so I'm totally open to different uh, different ways to describe this. But I think, um, you know, at the heart, what we're talking about is really what uh, what is important here. You know, whether we want to call it Web3 or the D-Web or decentralized technologies generally, um, you know, distributed technologies, decentralized technologies, um, that's kind of a, a semantic debate that I'm happy to have. But fundamentally what we're talking about is the same thing um, and this vision of sort of a decentralized future. Yeah, so let's dive into the fundamentals and I'll raise again the title of your recent policy report, To Be a Stranger Among Strangers, Ad Tech, Web3, and Data Privacy. This policy report discusses how targeted advertising has raised concerns about data privacy and how new decentralizing technologies which you've just described in the Web3 paradigm, may make existing data privacy regulations unsuitable. And you propose a sectoral approach to data privacy laws to govern the appropriate flow of information based on context-specific norms. And you highlight the need for policymakers to reframe data privacy laws and account for technological change. It sounds like what you are describing is a potential conflict between existing data privacy laws and decentralized systems in Web3. Am I understanding this correctly? Well, that's exactly right. And I think um, the best example that we have of this comes uh, immediately from the European Union. So in the European Union, they have what's known as the General Data Privacy Regulation, uh, GDPR, a, a short form. And this is a, a huge omnibus regulation that covers basically all data flows. Um, in the digital environment. And, uh, you know, it's I think it's a well-intentioned proposal. You know, there's very real concerns that people have about how their information is being collected, stored, used, processed, um, sold throughout our digital environment. And so uh, the European Union, you know, took a look at this and said, well, we need to create a st set of rules um, for, for the flow of information in our digital environment. Um, the problem, well... One of the problems, there are a lot of problems that we can get into. Um, one of the big problems of this approach is that it was really focused on our, the Web 2 environment. It was really focused on this kind of centralized um, environment, digital environment that we all inhabit now. And it was focused on trying to solve some of the, the apparent problems with that framework. Um, but in doing so, uh, it also create inhibited innovation for the future, right? So um, one of the big problems, and you know, I think this is pretty typical of how the European Union approaches um, regulation generally, but specifically tech regulation, is that they, they, they see a problem and uh, they tend to drive a nail with a sledgehammer. And um, you know, they can solve that problem, but they also tend to create other ripple effects from that um, from that one action. And so uh, what you see with uh, the GDPR, and in fact, the European Parliament, um, they openly admit this. They, they have their own, I think it's like 250 page report that examines how the GDPR interacts with blockchain uh, and decentralized technologies more generally. And they came to the same conclusion that, that Antonio and I did. It's just like that these things are incompatible. They are fundamentally uh, at odds with each other. Um, and so that is a specific example, but we're also seeing that conversation start to play out in the United States, whether it be at the state level, at the federal level. Um, and kind of our hope is that as we're having this conversation in the United States, that we don't fall into the same trap that the European Union did, that we can think about and create regulations and legislation in a way that allows for this innovation and doesn't kind of get stuck in the mud, as it were. Well, let's talk about a specific example. I guess the GDPR um, has its, as one of its most important rights is the right to be forgotten. 
But when one thinks about blockchain and distributed ledger technologies and uh, transactions and their availability uh, for anyone to explore and to um, and to track, how does blockchain and distributed ledger technology square with a right to be forgotten? Well, I, it's very difficult to square. In fact, it's almost impossible to square. Um, and I want to be careful here because there's a lot of different ways that you can build a blockchain, as you know, and a lot of different ways that these these systems can work. But generally, the whole point of a blockchain is that it's an immutable ledger. The whole point of this in technology is that you can't go, someone can't go in and, and unilaterally tamper with, delete, change information. Um, so that's, you know, I think we point to several different problems and, and that's one of the biggest ones, right? Um, if you create a rule that says, um, thou shalt delete data when the consumer requests it, um, that, sure, we can argue about um, how that interacts with kind of a Web2 environment where you have kind of traditional data sets, traditional um, uh, ledgers where a single company could, you know, go in and create a process by which they could create data. But when you're talking about a distributed network, um, those questions become uh, much more difficult, if not impossible, you know? Um, and I want to be clear again, there, there are ways that you could theoretically go in and, and change information and, and delete data. Um, however, when you're doing it at kind of such a minute scale where, you know, if I have transactions on X blockchain, um, that I have the right to go to the whole network and um, demand that that data be uh, deleted. Um, one, you know, I, do I really have that right when it comes to such a distributed network? Two, what are the technical measures that would have to be put in place to allow that to happen? And I think the most important question when you're talking about a distributed network or a decentralized network is that um, you kind of got to get everybody on board, right? If, if you have... Um, thousands of nodes that have all stored uh, either the whole ledger or part of the ledger. Um, if only one individual decides that they don't want to, you know, go along with this, you know, if I get to delete my data and they don't agree that I should be able to delete my data, um, well, then they're in violation of the law and, you know, they have broken the law or the regulation um, and will be sanctioned for that. You know, I think that there's, uh, and this is one of the fundamental issues about um, when you're thinking about these issues of privacy and and really applying um, laws that were written for like an analog centralized digital environment and applying them to a decentralized environment, um, the question naturally becomes, well, who who is liable? Who actually is involved here, if anyone? Um, and so when it comes to the right to be forgotten, you know, uh, the right to be forgotten is fundamentally at odds with an immutable ledger. There's an adage that if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. And when you were discussing Web2 and centralized organizations, it caused me to think about all of the various services that are provided for free uh, by those centralized organizations. And I'm wondering if the widespread use of targeted digital advertising, and you do discuss this in your privacy piece, um, whether that impacts individuals' right to data privacy, and whether there's a solution here um, where this conflict can be reconciled with new decentralized technologies emerging in the Web3 paradigm. Well, certainly. I think that's, um, that's kind of a two-part question, right? And, and I think it's a really important one because um, one thing that we, uh, in putting this paper together and in having the conversations that came with that, really started to question and think about is um, why is data privacy such a big issue? Why is this something that we even are talking about? Um, it's been a big issue in the past three or four years, um, but for a long time, it really wasn't. People didn't think about the data that they were that was being collected on them. They didn't really care that much. And there's a lot of polling that that, that backs up that claim. Um, so, kind of why are why do we start caring about this now? Um, and what is the chain of causality that, that got us to the point where we have things like GDPR or at the federal level, um, you know, there's proposals now for big comprehensive privacy regulations in the United States. Um, and our conclusion really was that this all comes back to advertising, right? So 
part of the problem, and the you know people are on record saying that the original sin of the internet uh, is advertising, digital targeted digital advertising, um, and I think that that really that there's a there's a hint of truth in that. You know, I think it's it's a bit of a hyperbolic claim. There's a, a lot of sins of the internet, right? But um, why you know why do companies collect information in the first place? They're not doing it for no reason. You know, uh, for you know, say Meta or Google or Amazon or you know, insert X company. Um, why are they collecting that information? They're not collecting it just because they want to have it or they're evil corp or they you know, want to do nefarious, terrible things with it, uh, they're collecting it because it makes the advertising better. And that means that they can sell uh, advertising space at a higher uh, premium. They can make more money. Um, I think, you know, look at Facebook. One of What made Facebook um, the economic powerhouse that it is compared to something like Twitter? Um, you know, they started at about the same time. They were targeting roughly the same... Um, Part, uh, section to the population, They're both social media platforms. Um, really, the difference is that Facebook figured out how to um, collect more information and more effectively target advertising. Um, so when you're talking about data privacy, and this is kind of a, a, a chain, right? When you're talking about data privacy, what you're really talking about is data governance. You're talking about how should information be collected? How should it be stored? Um, who should be able to have access to it? Um, should it be able to be commoditized and sold to third parties? Um, and those are really important questions, right? But they all flow from the initial economic reason uh, that you have this bulk data collection in the first place, which is to sell ad space. Um, and this is something I think uh, in the paper we talk about uh, Google, right? Um, so if you kind of go back to... Um, the earlier days of the internet, a lot of it was fee for service. You know, you would pay to use a platform, something like AOL, um, and you pay a subscription service. And even now, we still have you know software as a ser ser service and and subscription service models. Um, but the thing that Google figured out really early on that made it what it is today is that they could really effectively sell advertising space. There's something about the Google search that if I'm searching for, um, you know, flights to Maui, that at that moment, I am very susceptible to advertisements. Um, and so they were able to effectively sell this advertising space uh, at a really high markup. And so um, that happened initially. And then they figured out the more information that I collect on you, the user, the more effectively I can target this advertisement and the more money I can get out of advertisers. Um, and so that's the fundamental chain that we're talking about here. And um, you, we, you know, we believe that eventually you're going to have advertising. Advertising is one of those um, you know, original, uh, original markets, original things that have kind of always been with humanity throughout time. Um, eventually, it's going to make its way into the Web3 environment as well. Um, so how do we need to be thinking about those things? Um, that was a very long-winded answer. Um, so I want to pause here before we kind of move on to the second uh, second part of that question. Yeah, that's fine. And I think that was a very instructive answer, at least to the first part of the question. But I do want to follow up on the first part. Um, we talked about user data being collected by companies to serve targeted ads. But isn't it attribution as the key to make it valuable to advertisers? Well, right. And I think this is um, this is a big part of, of what we talk about in the paper, right? So, uh, you know, I, going back to that Google example, um, one of the things that that made makes Google so valuable as a company uh, and so valuable to advertisers is it is really the last link in the chain. So when we think about advertising, you're thinking about how do you get someone to buy something, you know, like, um, let's say Coca-Cola. If I want to get, if I'm Coca-Cola and I want to get you, Gary, to buy Coca-Cola, um, there's a lot of different ways that I can, I can kind of try and, um, you know, get that to happen or, or that usually costs a lot of money, but there's a lot of ways that I can try and influence you, um, to convince you to buy my product. Um, and in the digital environment that it happens everywhere. So, um, you know, I might have a, a promoted tweet. I might, 
you know, have a banner advertisement on Facebook. I might um, have, you know, artificially uh, generated content that is kind of steering you towards buying Coca-Cola. Um, but the real question is, is who takes credit for that? So um, advertising businesses are really built on this idea of taking credit for the final end purchase. Um, so, you know, taking it back to a digital example, if I want to get you to download my app and then make an in-app purchase, say I'm Amazon. Um, well, where in that chain of causality do you actually get attribution? Who actually caused you to download the app and buy the, buy the product? Um, well, it turns out Google will always tell you it's Google. So if you want to buy, um, you know, a Coca-Cola, if you see an advertisement on whether it's television, on a billboard, uh, on, you know, a promoted tweet, any of these types of advertising, um, where do you normally go the, as you're in order to make that point of purchase, right? You go and you Google where to buy Coca-Cola. And so Coke being, or Google being the last uh, step in that chain means that they get to effectively take all the credit. Um, even though there's this whole long um, series of, of actions and, and money that's been spent, um, fundamentally, Google gets to take the credit for that last action. Um, and I think that that's a really important part of, you know, if we're going to talk about this in a Web3 environment, is how do you attribute um, where, who gets the credit for actions that are taken um, in the digital environment? So if, you know, something like, like Filecoin wants to advertise and convince people to use their service, um, who ends up getting to take credit for that advertisement and kind of monetize it in that way? So let's get to the fun part of the question, which you identified as the second part of the question, and that is, how can this conflict be reconciled with new decentralized technologies emerging in the Web3 paradigm? Sure. I think um, there's a lot of conversation in kind of the Web3 and decentralized um, ecosystem about ownership and owning data, owning identity, and then being able to commodify it individually. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, interesting conversations that can be had around that. Um, but fundamentally, I think people um, uh, are, are misled about exactly how valuable their data is. You know, I saw um, there was a report, uh, you know, and this comes out in the Web2 environment as well. People propose that Facebook should pay me um, to use their service um, and the data that they collect on me. But your data really isn't that valuable. You know, for all of the data that Facebook collects on you in a year, it's worth about $2, right? Uh, that's some report um, that came out several years ago. And so, you know, in terms of commodifying data for the individual, um, that's an interesting conversation I think should be had. Um, but fundamentally, I think the, the thing that we should be talking about is, is not necessarily commodification, but control of identity. And, and how you can actually um, influence identity. So if you think about in a Web2 environment, some concept, some company like Amazon, right? Um, the reason that we're having such a conversation about data privacy right now, to me, is that that data is linked directly to your identity, whether that be your email, your uh, phone number, your account, um, even your, your device user ID, right? That one of the big reasons that people feel uncomfortable with data being collected on them, um, even though, you know, they have read the terms of service and they get the service and they, they you know, they, you can figure out how some of these companies are, what the data is that they're collecting on you. Um, but one of the fundamental issues is that people are quite frankly creeped out at the idea of all this information being di uh, uh, tied directly to their real world personal identity. Um, and that's something that you're seeing pop up in, in state level, um, and even in the GDPR, these state level data privacy regulations is a, kind of a, a right to anonymity and a right to um, anonymize data. So there's kind of two ways that you can deal with this in the Web2 environment. You can um, break the link to identity and uh, you can maintain, you can keep the data, either you can delete the data entirely, right, as the GDPR has, or you can anonymize the data. So you can keep the data, but it can't be linked 
or reasonably linkable to, which is the, the a very specific phrasing there, reasonably linkable to your real world identity, whether that be your email, your phone number, your device ID. And so I think that that really brings up very interesting conversations in the Web3 space. Um, so the way that we think about this, and, and we, we kind of um, break this out in, in more detail in the paper, is that in the Web2 environment, um, information is linked directly to your identity, but it is generally held privately. So going back to that example of Amazon, Amazon, you know, if you go and you buy Coca-Cola uh, on Amazon, they're going to keep that information. They're going to keep that bit of data and they're going to tie it to your account. They're going to say, Gary bought, you know, Coca-Cola on this day. And that helps them later on figure out how to sell you more Coca-Cola. Um, that's kind of how the digital advertising world works. But that information is kept private. Um, you know, with the exception of selling data to third party data brokers and the like, um, you know, Am there's not like some huge public ledger where everyone can go and like mine and look at what Amazon is doing uh, and what information it has on you. Um, so to reiterate, that means that your data is directly linked to your identity, but it is being held privately. In a Web3 environment, that, uh, that calculus is inverted. And so in a way that information is not directly linked to your identity, your real world personal identity, but generally, again, speaking generally, uh, it's publicly available in some way. That's helpful. What um, would you explain to our audience who is diving into the details of your policy report where you talk about a possible solution, a sectoral approach? Can you please explain to us what you mean by a sectoral approach to data privacy laws working in practice? And what are some of the potential benefits of that approach? Sure. And I think, um, again, having a kind of a historical context to this is really helpful. Um, so a sectoral approach to data privacy is really what we have now, you know. Um, we've always been concerned about the flow of information, who gets controlled information in certain contexts. Um, you know, we talk about this in, in the financial world. There's a lot of rules and regulations about, um, you know, banks collecting your social security number so that you can comply with certain laws. Um, and how, what are they allowed to do with that information? How do they store it? But I think the better example here is actually when it comes to medical information. Um, so medical information is really uh, is a really unique area where everyone is very concerned about general access. You know, it's a very private thing um, uh, in general. And so there's kind of two components to that. So there's the nominative, like the the kind of value laden side of that, which is kind of the Hippocratic oath, right? And these these norms that have been established over centuries about privacy between, uh, you know, a medical practitioner and their patients. And that's just kind of a general, you know, ad hoc code that uh, I think if you talk to most doctors, they would agree with, right? But there's also a, a legal component to that. In the United States, it's HIPAA. Uh, and this is a law that, you know, essentially lays out what doctors in, uh, are allowed to do with the information that they collect on patients. And um, it sets out, it's basically established under a principle of um, the appropriate flow of information, given that we are, you know, given that we are talking about healthcare, very sensitive healthcare information about individuals, um, what sorts of flows of information should we allow? Um, and I think a helpful example here would be if you went to your doctor and got um, a scan, you know, a chest scan of your heart. Um, and, uh, you know, you just went to your general practitioner, they took this scan, they were a little bit concerned about something that they saw. And so they decided to send it over to the specialist at the hospital, you know, the cardiovascular specialist. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable, uh, flow of information. You know, we are going to send this across the internet and it, a long time ago, you would have just put it in a, an envelope and sent it over. But now a lot of this happens across the internet. Um, we're sending this information so that somebody can look at it. And we would, I think everyone would agree that that's a generally appropriate flow of information. Um, you've given your doctor permission to send this information to other doctors 
so that they can, you know, help make you better and and potentially um, find any problems that are going on. Now, if your doctor took that chest scan and, um, you know, posted it on their Instagram, um, I think we would generally say that that is not an appropriate flow of information. It's the same information. It's the same data. But the context in which, is, in which it is being transmitted and who it is being transmitted to is the distinguishing factor. Um, and so I think that that is what, um, you know, generally the, the general approach that we have taken to legislating around data privacy is not so much focused on the specific kind of information, um, but establishing rules that lay out the appropriate flow of particular kinds of uh, particular kinds of information in particular contexts, and that's something that GDPR, for example, um, doesn't really do. GDPR basically says all information that is of this type must be treated in this way, um, regardless of kind of the context in which that that data is being um, collected, stored, transferred, uh, and and the like. I'd like to come back to anonymity for a moment. And anonymity may not be the same as privacy and may not be the same as confidentiality. But you did use the word anonymity. Um, and we are finding in the European Union that legislators are using that term as well. So for the moment, let's just stick with that word. When we're trying to reconcile and solve for a pivot from Web 2 to Web 3, and as you pointed out, Anonymity is a value proposition in Web 2 and certainly in the GDPR, as you've discussed. Why, in your view, and especially in light of the fact that the way you were describing it to me made me feel as if you believe that there is overregulation in the European Union and that is actually driving out or stifling or having a chilling effect on innovation, if that's the case, and if there's this value proposition in Web 2 for anonymity with the GDPR, why, in your view, are European regulators, such as in MICA, the markets in crypto assets, Article 68, looking to make it harder for CASPs or crypto asset service providers from listing coins that have anonymity enhancing features, and unless transaction history can be fully explored, Arguably, although there are more regulations to come that further define and clarify, uh, those CASPs would be prohibited from listing those coins. Seems to me like there's a disconnect there. Could you please address that? You know, Gary, I think that's a that's a really interesting uh, and important question. And uh, if you want someone to divine what is going on in the European Union, I'm probably not the best person to do that. But I, you know, I, I'll take a stab at it. And I think um, from watching what the European Union has done. Uh, whether it be with GDPR or um, the Digital Markets and Digital Service Act, or even what they're doing now with cryptocurrency and crypto regulations, um, there is a generally, in my view, kind of a, a fear that um, the European Union has about kind of innovation and technology. If you look at um, how the co those countries have developed, there's a reason that there basically isn't any major tech player in the EU. And there, you know, if you look at kind of all of the major tech companies in the world and, and big tech pod projects, big innovations, uh, the vast majority of them are coming out of the United States. Um, there's a few in China, there's a few in Japan, you know, there's kind of spaced around Korea and, and other places. Um, but they practically never come out of the European Union. And in fact, um, you know, I think we were talking about this uh, uh, previously that you know, I can't think of a single major crypto player um, that is, you know, founded and 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 um, operating primarily out of the European Union, or was kind of, um, you know, built with that in mind. And um, but at the same time, the European Union likes to kind of protect what it already has. And uh, if you look at, you know, the the traditional tech world, you can see this with um, national champions, and so. Um, and for a long time, uh, the European Union was kind of jealous of the United States in our technological innovation. And so they established um, a lot of rules and regulations um, and, you know, subsidies and things to try and uh, 
bring tech talent and bring tech companies and create what they call their own national champions. Um, they have they've been you know not super successful at that, and I think the, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one is that these the rules and regulations, whether they be consumer focused or whether they be market focused, um, are typically reactionary and they're typically based in a certain amount of fear of um, what the future might bring. So, um, you know, I think the the European Union generally wants to prevent um, bad things from happening. And so this is kind of, um, you know, in the United States, we have a lot of conversations about uh, permissionless innovation versus permissioned innovation. Um, and, you know, I think the conversation is, is somewhat shifting in the United States uh, on this. But if we think about it in the European context, the Europeans traditionally take a very permissioned approach to innovation. And what I mean by that is that they're fearful, so fearful of potential harms from innovation that they want to make sure that they mitigate every risk before they allow innovation to happen. In the United States, we've typically taken um, the the opposite approach of permissionless innovation, which is that we're going to allow you to innovate, and then if there are harms, then we can figure out ways to to address and mitigate those harms once they actually appear. Um, but it seems to me that there's a general anxiety in the EU over tech and innovation generally. You know. Um, it's not we're not just seeing this uh, when it comes to crypto either. You know, in conversations around AI, the EU is also, um, you know, really trying to take a very cautious approach to allowing certain types of innovation and disallowing other types. Whereas in the United States, we're generally saying, um, have at it. You know, there's ethical boundaries that we should we should, you know, uh, respect when it comes to artificial intelligence. Um, but generally, we want you to go out and innovate because that's what the United States tech industry has been really good at. Um, so I don't know if that that perfectly answers your question, but I think that that's generally what you're seeing is this a continuation of a general trend of uh, a requirement of permissioned innovation in the EU and, and anxiety about what the future might hold, whether or not it actually will you know, cause those harms or not. That's a very comprehensive and wonderful answer to the question. And I recognize it was a, a long and compounded question. So thanks for that. Um, in your policy report, you cite to a Cornell University professor, Helen Nissenbaum. Um, full disclosure, I'm a very proud Cornell University alum. Uh, and I did take the time to read her paper as well in preparing for this podcast. She has one titled Cryptography, Trust, and Privacy. It's complicated. This was published in November 2022, and it was co-authored, but you cite to Helen Nissenbaum. In that paper, she discusses agency with regard to flow of information. Could you please discuss that topic for a bit, especially since you teased it a bit in an answer to an earlier question? Sure. Um, so I think the, you know, trying to unpack, you know, I'm not going to sit here and, and speak for Professor Nissenbaum. She has, you know, if you want to read um, she has an absolutely wonderful book called Privacy and Context, where she really teases out this idea of contextual integrity. And um, I'm going to kind of summarize some of those things here. But if you want, um, you know, she has her whole career has has been focused on a lot of these questions. So I'd highly encourage everyone, you know, don't take my word for it. Go read what she's read. Uh, go read what she's written. Um, she'll explain it far better than I could. Um, but to summarize a little bit, really what uh, I think uh, disembalms big point is when it comes to privacy is this idea of, of appropriate flows of information for a given contexts and the agency that goes with that. So humans and individuals should have a right to control the information um, to a certain degree, uh, control information about themselves. You know, this is what, you know, this goes back all the way to, to Warren and Brandeis and their idea of right to privacy um, and this kind of idea of user-centered privacy that that you as the user, you as the individual, should um, be able to control information about yourself. Um, in you know when um, Warren and Brandeis, this is uh, you know Supreme Court Justice uh, 
um, Brandeis, when they were writing this in the Harvard Law Journal, they were writing about um, newspapers and yellow journalism. And they were writing in a time, you know, an, a, an analog era. Um, but I think their, their ideas have kind of come forward into the digital era um, in a way that doesn't quite fit. So it's hard to have total user-centered privacy. It is very difficult in a digital world to have total control over all information about yourself. Practically impossible, I would add. Um, and so I think a lot of what Nissenbaum is is struggling with and 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 critiques in her in her work is that idea of privacy, that you as the individual have the end all be all control over every piece of information about yourself, um, partially from a practical standpoint, um, but partially from you know an ethical and normative standpoint. Um, and so her her idea is that instead of thinking about um, total control over all information in all contexts, that really from an ethical standpoint, we should operate, and she calls this contextual integrity, um, that we should think about information flows within certain contexts and then establish rules that govern those contexts, whether those be legal rules, ethical rules, and norms, societal rules, um, there's different ways that you can apply that. Um, but that's fundamentally what Nissenbaum is taking. And if we're talking about this particular context, so she never, uh, in her original book, uh, you know, she was talking about kind of a, a pre-crypto digital environment, a pre-web through world. Um, but, you know, as you, you mentioned in her, in her 2022 paper, um, she says this stuff is really complicated. Um, and it's really difficult to kind of establish a one-size-fits-all rule that applies that should apply equally in all contexts um, because different contexts are different, right? Um, my relationship uh, with Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and their collection of my information is very different context than, you know, going back to that example earlier of, you know, my doctor collecting information on me. Um, I have very different expectations from those, uh, those different actors and the different contexts in which they are using different information. And so we should be thinking about this, you know, you know, again, to paraphrase Nissenbaum, we really should be, when we're thinking about creating rules and standards, we should be thinking about context-specific appropriate flows of information. And we should establish whether they be standards, you know, societal standards or legal rules that allow for the nuance there, that allow for flexibility um, and that, you know, govern those, those flows of information in an appropriate way for that given context. Well, what about the agency of the individual to control that flow of information? Right. Functionality, consent. Right. So I think that this is something that the United States has generally done pretty well on, that you should have some agency over the information about yourself. In fact, you are, at the end of the day, you are in control of that information. You, it's your information, right? Um, but once that information is sort of disclosed and, and is governed by those appropriate flows of information, you don't get a, to retroactively decide um, that that information shouldn't be controlled or it shouldn't be allowed. Um, so I think the an example here is, you know, if I, um, in the Web2 context, I think there's a lot of conversations about terms of service, and I think there's a lot of ways that we can make terms of service better. Um, there's a lot of ways that uh, we can allow more consent and more informed consent in these in these contexts. But once you give Facebook consent, once you you know sign those terms of service, um, you don't get to retroactively come back and say, "Well, I well I really didn't mean that." Right? Once the information has been disclosed, then and as long as that you have consented to the the standards and the norms of that appropriate flow, um, then you can't retroactively come back and say that this is you know super problematic. Um, you can try and establish better flows. You can try and um, reframe the context for the next time. Um, but really, you should consent to the information flows that uh, you think are appropriate or we as a society think are appropriate. Um, I, I think that's a better answer to the question you were asking, but happy to you know continue going down that rabbit hole as well. So, Luke, we talked about attribution. We talked about targeted ads. We talked about data linkage. When you think about communication, we haven't really talked a lot about communication. 
communication is data. And there are platforms out there that are end-to-end -end encrypted, whereby I can have a conversation with you, and the only people who have access to that conversation are you and me, and potentially a regulator, if a regulator is able to, in a lawful constitutional way, um, through a lawful process, perhaps it's going to a judge and obtaining a warrant, can either go to you or me and ask for our device that has that application on it and then request the details and obtain the details of that end-to-end -end encrypted data. But apart from that, and maybe one or two other examples, that communication is entirely private between the two of us. Society appears to have gotten comfortable with that. And by society, I include regulators globally. Apple, WhatsApp, Signal, all of these platforms allow for that end-to-end -end encrypted communication where there is no attribution, there is no linkage, there is no targeted advertising, there is no weaponizing of data. In the financial sphere, what we are seeing in this pivot to Web3 are protocols, blockchain protocols, building techn technological solutions for encrypted financial transactions, end-to-end -end encrypted financial transactions that are protected by elegant cryptography. And the same dynamic applies. Why has society and why have regulators become mostly comfortable with the notion of end-to-end -end -end encryption in communication, but yet have a different perspective when it comes to financial transactions on the blockchain? So Gary, I, I really love that analogy, and I had never thought about that comparison. So I am uh, have always been a very big advocate for encrypting, encryption and encrypted technologies generally. Um, you know, us at Lincoln Network, we've been, um, we've worked with uh, supporting uh, the Open Technology Fund, which is a government, a U.S. government-run program to build encrypted technologies. If you look into it, Signal was funded by the U.S. federal government, right? Um, so, and Tor as well. Um, and so I think, you know, it's it's an issue of control. It's a question of control. So for the vast majority of human history, um, governments and well, I think law enforcement specifically, you know, I think that's kind of the subtext uh, of part of your question, um, had kind of were, had to be okay with the fact that they couldn't control what people were doing, right? So if you talk about communications, um, I can't enter your house. You know, if we go back to the 15th century, um, the law enforcement of the time couldn't enter your house and know what you were talking about. You know, if you're, they don't have that level of um, control and surveillance, quite frankly. Um, and then you kind of get into the original digital era, even if you want to go like back to the start of the telephone, right? Um, and these new innovations allowed for in, in new and unique ways allowed for surveillance. And, um, you know, whether or not you want to call it control, I think is, a, is an interesting question, but a certain level of control. The government could, could know what you were doing. Um, and, you know, it kind of has this minority report quality of being able to predict and stop things before they happen. Um, but now what you're seeing is, you know, we talked about web one, web two, web three, and web three as a reversion back to kind of the original principles of web one, you're seeing the same thing, I think, when it comes to encryption more generally, right? So you used to could uh, have these conversations uh, completely absent of government surveillance. And then, you know, uh, especially, you know, think about around the Cold War when uh, we were bugging houses and getting wiretaps and, and the kind of the advent of all of that. You could never really totally be sure that the government wasn't listening to you, especially if you're, you know, imagine like Soviet spy or something. Um, but now we're going back to, we're kind of a reversion to um, that sort of surveillance-less um, environment where you have total control over the information that you are sending and receiving. And I think that makes um, the government nervous because they've lost a capacity that they used to have. Um, and I think we as a society are, you know, I think free speech 
specifically, uh, you know, in kind of Western liberal democracies, right, is a fundamental thing. We all get it, right? There's a reason it's the first of the amendments, right? Um, and so when you kind of tell me what to say or tell me what not to say, or you are listening to me and what I'm saying, and that might have impacts, I think we have a guttural reaction to that as a society. Um, we're controlling what you say. Right, exactly. We're controlling what you say. We're punishing you for what you say. And we as a society, especially in the United States, have a guttural reaction to that. Um, and so that's why I think we've been really, um, you know, pretty much okay with things like Signal or iMessage, end-to-end encryption. Um, and, you know, there's notable examples of the government going in and trying to force companies to break that encryption and the company's saying no. Uh, and then, you know, it goes all the way up through the courts and the courts eventually decide, no, the federal government can't force you to break encryption. They can't force you to put a back door in. I think Apple is a fantastic example of this. Um, you know, for, for all the, the faults and the flaws, this is one thing that they are very, very, very good at. And that's standing up and saying, no, we're not going to break um, our system just because you, you know, the FBI or whoever, um, want more control over the system. Um, I don't think we have as guttural a reaction in the financial sense. Uh, I think all of those arguments hold true. Um, one of the reasons that governments are so nervous about um, cryptocurrencies and, um, and financial privacy in a digital era is because they had so much control, right? Um, if you go back 500 years, you know, let's go back to the 1500s again. Um, the only real way you can transact is by bartering or having cash. And for a long time, cash ruled society. And then you kind of get into to checking and banking and digital banking. Um, and each iteration of that gave the government more control and more surveillance capacity over people's financial lives. Um, and so now that that is kind of being... Um, rolled back and there are now alternatives to, you know, I think um, people like to call, you know, Bitcoin and, and Ethereum uh, kind of like the digital cash. I think there's, that's not a great example, right? There's, um, uh, but I think there, it, it, there's a hint of it that rings true, that this is something that you as the user have control over and should have control over. And there's really nothing the government can do about it. Um, and so what you're seeing and why this is such a big deal kind of in the financial realm is that they've pretty much given up on the speech. side. In fact, I would say they've lost, right? They tried. Um, there were a bunch of lawsuits over this. Um, there was some legislation that was proposed um, and they lost, right? Um, I don't think that they've necessarily lost yet in the financial context. Uh, I think they probably will lose in the long run. Um, because, you know, that comparison to me makes perfect sense, right? Why is it different in a financial context versus a speech context? I think it may also be that, and I love your description of control. I think that's right on. Um, one of the other attributes is that financial transactions can now be linked, aggregated, and used to pattern behavior. And for various jurisdictions where certain behavior is deemed non-desirable, being able to link financial transactions to behavior provides a measure of control of population that we are seeing play out in China in a way that is quite traumatic. Um, and I'm wondering if our inability to find a similar comfort with communication and financial transactions, preserving confidentiality, will simply land us where China is now, where government can determine patterns of behavior based on what you've purchased or who you've sent money to or where you've received money, and then use that to control behavior. You know, I think it's it's a bit of a slippery slope to kind of say that, you know, this will end up, you know, will end up being kind of a totalitarian regime like China. You know, my one of my colleagues um, literally wrote the book. He spent a lot of time in Shenzhen and literally wrote the book on the surveillance state um, 
uh, that is being you know, used to oppress the Uyghurs. So I think that that's, there's a lot to unpack in that particular example. Um, but I think your point rings true. And I think I'm going to provide um, a, a secondary example that I think might um, kind of get at this question a little bit better. So Please. there is, um, it's kind of a famous example that's always been used uh, around crypto uh, communities um, that we like to think about cryptocurrency in a very domestic centered context. And we kind of tend to forget about the global context. And um, one of the examples that's given is Afghanistan. So in Afghanistan, I don't know if this is still true. I imagine it probably is. I'm not a Middle Eastern expert. Um, but as the story goes, um, it is uh, supposedly illegal in Afghanistan for women to have their own bank account independent of um, their husband. You know, this is part of the Sharia system and and the, the the Taliban control and so this cr obviously creates problems for women that are trying to get out and become economically independent and get out of particularly abusive scenarios um, but there's a, an example that's given of a woman who started her own business and was selling uh, products internationally um, you know handcrafted products that she was selling internationally um, and she started to accept Bitcoin as uh, the way to get, um, basically the way to transact, the way to get value for her goods um, that was independent of her husband and that eventually allowed her to kind of get out of uh, an abusive scenario. Um, and she kind of, um, as the story goes, right, she then told other women about this and started kind of a whole business that was based around sending these goods abroad and getting those transactions in Bitcoin. Um, so I think that that's, you know, it, especially from a, a Western liberal um, mindset, we look at that and say, wow, isn't that fantastic? Isn't that great that, you know, this, uh, this woman was able to get out of an abusive scenario in an oppressive theocratic regime because of financial freedom and financial privacy specifically. And yet when we kind of bring it back to our own context, um, we have a different reaction to it or maybe not as visceral of a reaction to it um so i think that that's an important way to look at this so um and that's why i appreciate you bringing up the china context because when you're looking at kind of authoritarianism digital authoritarianism is a, is a thing that we talk a lot about at lincoln um these tools uh can be a very very strong factor in countering those kinds of authoritarian regimes. Um, and so I think the important thing is to kind of think about the broader context of this. Um, so when you talk about Signal, you know, going back to um, the messaging context for encryption, um, one of the things and the reason that the United States government does fund encrypted technologies and development, research and development of encrypted technologies, is not really because they want people in the United States to be able to use encrypted technologies. They're kind of agnostic about that. I think generally, you know, you, know um, you can kind of say what you want to say in the United States and you're not going to be thrown in jail for it generally. Um, but they develop these programs and these are DOD funded programs, CIA funded programs because of the international context, because these privacy preserving technologies can have such a huge impact uh, in other parts of the world where they don't have the same freedoms that we do. Um, I mean, if you want a, a evidence of this, go look at the rise of encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted apps in Ukraine right now. Like, go look up the statistics. It's absolutely astronomical. And so when we're talking about these conversations, um, and, you know, there are people out there that still advocate, you know, banning end-to-end -end encryption, um, you know, banning kind of uh, pr privacy-preserving uh, technology generally um, for various reasons that we can I'm happy to get into um, they're usually talking about it in a very domestic context and they're talking about very small um, domestic you know small in the general sense uh, domestic risks and concerns um, when really we should be thinking about kind of the overall overarching global context of these technologies your Afghanistan example is quite powerful thank you for that but Bitcoin is not private it's public and it's pseudonymous, but with easy forensics, 
those transactions can be attributed to that Afghani woman and all of her friends who she told uh, of this wonderful technology. Should she have and would she have benefited from the use of a protocol that allowed for confidential transactions on the blockchain such that the Afghani government would not be able to, with the push of a few buttons, determine where every single transaction went to and was received from. Well, sure. I mean, I think that that's, that's a perfectly fair argument. Um, I use the Afghan example, and if I remember right, it comes from the very, very early days of cryptocurrency. You know, this is, I believe it was a book that I read that was written in about 2016, which means this example is probably coming from about, what, 2013? Um, and so Bitcoin is the example there um, because, uh, you know, it, that pseudonymous aspect gave them a certain amount of privacy um, and a certain amount of control. But the more amount, the more privacy and the more control that you can give people in those kind of contexts, the better. Um, so, you know, going back to the messaging context, um, the United States supported a lot of different technologies for a long time that allowed for more and more private context. You know, you go back to Tor, um, which I don't even know how long Tor's been around, but, um, you know, the original idea of that was to allow people to do things uh, more privately than they would on the, the original internet. And that's why the, the U.S. government um, funded it and helped develop it. Um, but Tor only went so far. There's ways to put back doors. There's ways to get information um, on, on Tor that, uh, you know, make it not totally private, which is why we kept developing, right? That's how we ended up getting Signal. This is how we ended up getting end-to-end end, end, end encryption. Um, so I think the farther you can go towards those things, um, especially in the global context when you're talking about countering digital authoritarianism, um, the more the better, in my view. Thanks. That's very helpful. This very podcast, PGP for Crypto podcast, that I co-host with my colleague Paul Brigner, PGP stands for Pretty Good Policy. So I'd like to discuss for a moment the key challenges, right? So what are some of the key challenges that policymakers will need to address in reconciling data privacy laws and decentralized systems? You might have some advice for them, uh, looking to better understand the potential of blockchain technology and create a supportive regulatory environment, or how policymakers might balance the need to protect data privacy with the need to foster innovation in the decentralized technology space. It'd be very helpful to get your thoughts about those topics. Sure. Well, I think from a very high level perspective, um, the point of the real point of writing this paper and of having these kinds of conversations is to open up the eye, open up lawmakers' eyes to some of these problems and some of these um, incongruities between future technologies and the laws that they're writing today. So an unfortunate reality of um, kind of the current political system in the United States is that we write laws and then they kind of are. They, we don't tend to iterate on laws very well. I think a good example of this is um, uh, COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, another data privacy law, I might add, um, that governs the flow of information about children under the age of 13. And so this law was written, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe it was 1996, um, or past, and we are now have you know, however many years later, however many decades later, are having big conversations about how to update this. Um, I would argue that you should, you know, if the political system was functioning better, uh, we would have been having these conversations iteratively. We could have made different changes um, that are, you know, that fit the context in different um, in different time periods. Uh, unfortunately, that's. Ten tends to not be how U.S. policymaking works. And so if you're going to be making a law that you now understand is probably going to exist in its current form for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years before we can have a chance to revisit it and have it uh, come into um, better compliance or congruence with um, new technologies, you should build it in a very tech neutral way. You should make these laws in a way that looks ahead. Um, so one of the big criticisms I have of the GDPR, and you know, another example would be California's privacy law, the, C the CCP, the CC California Consumer Privacy Act, I believe, um, that those laws were written for a very specific context, 
and we can argue about their effectiveness or efficacy in it for today's technologies, right? For the um, the digital environment we currently inhabit. Um, but what they do very poorly is consider what a future might look like uh, and what sorts of uh, rules and regulations would needed would be needed and where those incongruities and um, you know um, paradoxes, frankly, uh, could come. And so, at a very high level, I would encourage you know any lawmaker, whether it be at the federal or state level, um, that is thinking about data privacy, to take a good hard look at uh, at decentralized technologies, at blockchain technologies, and you know think about how those technologies might play out in the future, and what sorts of potential problems, potential roadblocks might come in. Because uh, what we saw with with GDPR was the European Union passed it. And then after they'd passed it, after they'd implemented it, then they came and did a big report and said, oh, yeah, actually, it turns out that blockchain technologies are pretty incompatible with this law. Um, so instead of changing the law and allowing for that innovation, um, you blockchain you know, projects should build to what the regulation is. Well, that's one, that's permissioned innovation. And two, it closes off whole avenues of innovation that could happen. Um, and I think that in the United States, you know, I can't tell Europe what to do as well uh, as you can, Gary, but um, I think in the United States, we should really focus on allowing those avenues to happen. And then if we need to, you know, rein some things in uh, farther on down, um, then we can do that. So I think from a very high level, that's my, that's my big um, proposal, but you know, if we want to talk specifics about kind of the concrete issues, happy to get into that as well. Well, Luke, as we're talking, uh, I think the United States Congress or certain members of the United States Congress are today in Brussels, and maybe tomorrow or later in the week will be going to Paris, and they are speaking with European regulators and policymakers about MiCA, the Market and Crypto Assets Regulation, which is quite comprehensive very ambitious, um, and at times problematic. If the United States will be following the lead of the European Union, are we setting a trap for ourselves domestically here in the United States in patterning legislation and policy and ultimately regulation after what might end up stifling innovation? Well, I think that's I'm 100%. I think that the United States should look, uh, when it comes to tech regulation and legislation more broadly, but specifically in such an innovative space uh, as crypto and blockchain technologies, that we really should be thinking more critically than um, than the European. You know, I think we coming back to that previous uh, conversation we were having about, you know, why is the European Union doing what they're doing? Well, they're doing what they're doing because they're afraid. They're doing what they're doing because they want to control what innovation can and should happen. Um, and, you know, you're seeing many in the United States now wanting to kind of push for that sort of an approach. Um, you know, uh, not to name names, but there are certain members of the Senate that are very scared of cryptocurrency uh, and, and the House of Representatives too, let's be clear, um, that are very scared of cryptocurrencies, blockchain technologies, and this innovation for, for various reasons. Um, and, you know, some of those fears certainly are, you know, valid. I'm not going to sit here and, and say that everything is all hunky-dory and this is all sunshine and rainbows. But um, taking a permissioned approach, as the European Union is doing to cryptocurrency specifically uh, with Mika and with kind of uh, these general broad sweeping regulations, even the DMA and the DSA as well, um, that that is just going to completely stifle the innovation. It's going to, it, and you're already seeing this in the European Union. Um, so if we want to be to continue to be this beacon of innovation, um, the kind of the hotbed of technological innovation in the world, um, we need to allow for these innovations. You know, I have a friend um, that uh, he works out in Utah, and Utah is notorious for what they call regulatory sandboxes, and these are ideas. Um, that if you want to create something, if you want to innovate, um, we're going to let you do it. We're going to let you do it for, let's say, a couple of years. Um, we're not going to, you know, we, the regulators, the government, we're not going to come after you and, and fine you and kind of beat you into submission um, with regulations. 
because we want to see what happens first. We want to see, you know, we can we can look at the risks, we can balance the risks and the harm or the risks and the benefits. Um, but we want to see where the innovation goes. Um, so if there's a, a problem with the regulation that you can't get over, um, we're going to kind of waive that regulation for a period of time. And I think that's something that we should really look at in the United States and more broadly taking that sort of an approach to innovation, um, kind of a cautious optimism approach where we're going to let you innovate. We want you to innovate. Um, and we're not going to unnecessarily put hurdles in your way or completely block um, particular uh, potential avenues of innovation um, proactively. Let's see where it goes. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, if there are risks, if there are problems, um, that's what governments are for. And we can come in and we can have those conversations when the risks actually materialize. But we shouldn't follow the European model of creating regulations, proactively creating regulations that hamper innovation, that prevent technologies from being made on unrealized and unmaterialized fears. So the notion of sandbox coordination and collaboration by stakeholders is absolutely fascinating and I think could approach that balance between regulation and innovation in a way that solves some of the concerns and responsibilities that regulators have with this driving need for innovation in this new disruptive space that we're finding ourselves in. I'm wondering, are there any other ways you think that stakeholders could work together to address these challenges? And let's assume for purposes of this conversation that it's all antitrust appropriate, whether under the Nor Pennington Doctrine, which is the uh, pair of U.S. Supreme Court cases that permits competitors to come together when normally they should be competing um, to advocate uh, on behalf of shared interests with regulators and, and policymakers. Um, what what other opportunities are there besides sandbox opportunities? Well, I think the big one that that is a big conversation right now at the, the federal level in the United States around cryptocurrency specifically is um, I think the regulatory agency should have an open door policy. I think that you should be able to go in and have conversations. Um, you know, I think that the in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission has been uh, particularly bad about this. Um, when you're coming with innovations and trying to figure out um, how innovations interact with regulations and legislation and how they should interact with regulations and legislation and what sorts of compliances need to happen under existing law, um, I think that there should be a certain amount of grace that goes with this, you know? Um, and. I understand this is kind of similar to a, a sandbox model uh, and not totally out of that vein, um, but you should be able to go in and kind of ask and say, hey, how do we need to write? How do we need to comply with this regulation? Um, what sorts of, uh, of steps do we need to take? You know, what licenses do we need um, in order to kind of get this novel thing off the ground? Um, this is something uh, I think some states have done pretty well with. I think Wyoming is very notable in being very open. Um, uh, Texas, to a certain degree, um, when it comes to mining, has been very open with um, having open door policies and saying, uh, you know, if you're coming in and acting in good faith, um, we're not going to punish you for that good faith. Um, I think at the federal level, you've seen some problems of specifically crypto projects going in and trying to act in good faith and trying to get questions trying to get questions answered so that they can comply um, with existing regulations and legislation um, and either not being given good answers um, or in some instances even having those answers used against them later on down the road. Um, that just discourages anyone from acting in good faith. And, um, you know, as much as I love the kind of move fast, break things ethos, um, Sometimes, especially when you're dealing with uh, very, very new technologies that we don't know what impact they're going to have on consumers and markets, um, having uh, an open door policy, having the conversation, being able to have the conversation with regulators, uh, I think is a very important component of this. I think our entire conversation really built to the conclusion that you emphasize in your policy report, which is it's not enough to tell innovators to build to the law. The law must account for and allow for technological change. 
I'd love to conclude this podcast with your thoughts about the conclusion that you emphasize in your policy report and how it is critically important to allow for that flexibility so that we can solve for regulatory need, but yet not have this chilling effect on innovation. You know, I'm glad that this is where you wanted to end this conversation because, you know, whether it be in the context of, of cryptocurrencies and what the electric coin company is doing um, or in all of these other contexts that we've talked we've talked about AI, we've talked about advertising, we've talked about uh, e-commerce, kind of gone all over the board here. Um, and there's this notable uh, idea in kind of tech policy and, and innovation policy and innovation issues um, of the issues of the seen and the unseen. Um, and so it's really easy to point at uh, innovations that, that, that have already happened and kind of look back and, and point at the risks and the problems. Um, I think this is what we're doing now with a lot of issues with regards to big tech and justifiably. Um, but when it comes to laws and regulations, the other side of that coin is the unseen, those unseen innovations, those things that didn't happen because of uh, the regulation and the legislation that prevented them from ever being conceived of in the first place. And when we're talking about innovation, that to me is the real risk. And that's something that I think lawmakers and regulators should be very, very careful of as they're you know, trying to come in and regulate and legislate on some of these issues, you know, be it data privacy, um, you know, we're having these conversations all across the kind of crypto spectrum, whether, you know, with exchanges and decentralized finance, um, stable coins all across the board. Um, certainly there is, uh, the whole role of government is to mitigate risks. The whole point of the regulatory state is to make sure that, that consumers are protected, that markets are free and that, you know, we don't have undue societal harm. Um, but in doing so, it's much more important to me that as we're mitigating these risks, as we're looking at these potential problems or real problems, that we make sure that we allow room for innovation and that we don't cut off those avenues. Because the last thing that we want to see, Gary, is that new regulations have a, a chilling effect on innovation and that prevent wonderful things that could have happened from happening. Thank you, Luke. In these early podcast sessions, Paul and I talked about the need for someone to speak at a boutique think tank level. And I think our audience will agree that um, the value and the perspective that you brought to this conversation was remarkable and uh, quite impressive. And I'm so thrilled that you could join us. Thank you for being on PGP for Crypto podcast. It was a real pleasure. And I hope to have a chance to work with you in the future. Well, thank you again for having me. It's been an absolutely wonderful conversation. And, and I hope we can continue having these kind of conversations in the future. Thanks, Luke.